On May 21, 2003, Kathleen Fulbig was convicted of three counts of murder, one count of manslaughter, and one count of maliciously inflicting grievous bodily harm. The four victims were her own children, all of whom had died before their second birthday. She was convicted of murder in the deaths of her son Patrick and her daughters Sarah and Laura, and of manslaughter in the death of her oldest son Caleb. Following her conviction, she was named Australia's worst female serial killer in the media and considered to be the country's most hated woman. Prosecutors at Kathleen's trial argued that she had smothered all four of her children, despite the absence of any forensic evidence supporting this scenario. Fulbig has always maintained that she did not kill her children. In the years following Kathleen's conviction, advances in genetics have provided stronger and stronger evidence that her children's deaths may have had medical rather than criminal causes. Currently, courts in New South Wales are facing the question, were the lives of Kathleen Fulbig's children taken by her own hand, or were the children's deaths and her subsequent convictions for killing them just part of the series of tragedies in her life, which had long been marred by heartache and hardship? Kathleen was born on June 14, 1967, to Kathleen Donovan and Thomas Britton. Her life was difficult and unstable from the start. Both of her parents liked to drink, and her father had violent tendencies. Her mother left home one day after a particularly bad argument with Thomas, leaving their daughter with him. A few weeks later, on January 8, 1969, a drunken Thomas encountered his wife on the street and angrily demanded that she return home. She refused. Thomas then stabbed the elder Kathleen 24 times with a 10-inch knife. He held her in his arms and kissed her face while waiting for authorities to arrive. Kathleen did not survive her injuries, and Thomas was sentenced to 15 years in prison. He was subsequently deported to England. Baby Kathleen was just 18 months old at the time of her mother's death. She was at first taken in by her mother's sister and her husband, but they quickly reported behavioral problems in the little girl. She was reportedly aggressive, preoccupied with her genitals, and uninterested in learning hygiene or proper manners. A medical officer who assessed her at a child health center found that Kathleen had likely been abused by her father since infancy. Kathleen's behavior put strain on her aunt's marriage, and the aunt told authorities in June of 1970 that she could no longer provide care for the child. During a psychological and education assessment after she was removed from her aunt's home, Kathleen was described as a very disturbed little girl and found to have an IQ of just 77. Kathleen was placed in a foster home in the town of Newcastle, and the new environment seemed to help with her behavior and development. By the time she reached grade two, her IQ was measured at 100, and she demonstrated good behavior and attendance at school. Behavioral problems would still arise over the years, with Kathleen being described as inattentive, disruptive, and defiant in grade five. Kathleen left school six months before finishing grade 12, but not for academic reasons. She has stated that around this time, her relationship with her foster mother completely deteriorated. According to Kathleen, this resulted from ongoing issues they had. She has described her foster mother as unpredictable and controlling, which resulted in Kathleen never having many friends and being physically disciplined when she did not meet her foster mother's strict standards for her numerous household chores. Kathleen left home when she left school and moved in with a friend. One weekend soon after, she met the man who would become her husband while out dancing at a nightclub. Craig Fulbig was six years Kathleen senior and worked as a forklift operator. Kathleen immediately found him charming and viewed him as a knight in shining armor who could give her support and love in her largely chaotic life. Kathleen married Craig in 1987 at the age of 18. Both Kathleen and Craig looked forward to having a family as an obvious next step. Craig came from a family of eight children and was still processing the death of his own mother, who had died when he was just 15, and Kathleen had lacked a stable family life of her own growing up, so having children was important to both of them for their own reasons. 
When Kathleen became pregnant for the first time, she was very protective of her unborn child. She made improvements to her diet and made her husband go outside to smoke so that she would not be breathing in so much of the secondhand smoke. Kathleen had an easy pregnancy, but a difficult delivery, which required the use of forceps. She was unable to hold her baby for a few hours, but stated that she felt complete with her husband and her child as soon as she did get to hold him. Caleb Gibson Fulbig was born on February 1st, 1989. He was full term and born at a healthy weight. Kathleen woke up around 1 a.m. on February 20th to feed Caleb and then went back to bed. When she woke up to use the bathroom two hours later, she went in to check on the baby while she was awake. She found that he wasn't breathing. She screamed for her husband and Craig performed CPR on Caleb while Kathleen called an ambulance. Paramedics were unable to resuscitate the baby. Caleb was just 19 days old when he passed away. His cause of death was found to be sudden infant death syndrome, or SIDS. Kathleen and Craig were devastated by their son's death, but decided to try for another baby towards the end of 1989. Kathleen soon became pregnant. Her second pregnancy was obviously far more stressful, and Kathleen and Craig purchased all new bedding and made home improvements they believed would help reduce the risk of SIDS for their second child. Patrick Allen Fulbig was born on June 3, 1990. In light of his brother's death, he underwent a variety of tests when he was a week and a half old, including a sleep study, an ECG, and a barium test to check for reflux, all of which had normal results. On October 18, 1990, when he was four and a half months old, Patrick experienced what medical experts classified as an apparent life-threatening event. Patrick had been coughing, so Kathleen went to comfort him, and he went back to sleep. When she went to check on him at 4.30 a.m., Patrick was not breathing and had turned blue. He was rushed to the hospital and resuscitated. However, the brain damage the incident caused left him partially blind and suffering from seizures, which meant that he required constant supervision. Kathleen had planned to go back to work, but Craig took on a more demanding job so that she could stay home and provide Patrick with the constant care he now required. Patrick was taken to the hospital four more times in November and December of 1990, after suffering subsequent seizures. Patrick passed away on February 13, 1991, while Craig was at work. His cause of death was found to be asphyxia due to airway obstruction as a result of a seizure. Kathleen became depressed and preoccupied with what external factors she had failed to address that could have saved Patrick. She and Craig coped by making several major life changes, including selling the house where both their sons had died, moving to a new town, and starting new jobs. Kathleen became pregnant again and fixated on limiting her food intake and becoming as physically fit as possible for her baby. Sarah Kathleen Fulbig was born on October 14, 1993, and had a normal sleep study at three weeks old. Kathleen and Craig put her crib in their bedroom so that they could keep a closer eye on her as she slept. Tragically, Sarah still passed away on August 30, 1991, at 10 and a half months old. During one of her checks on Sarah, Kathleen had found her blue and not breathing. Sarah's death certificate listed her cause of death as SIDS. While the death of each of their children had left both Kathleen and Craig understandably depressed, following Sarah's death, their relationship almost fell apart due to each other's poor mental states. They again sold their house and moved, this time to be closer to Craig's family. Kathleen put on weight, but then feared that this would push away her husband. She returned to obsessively tracking her diet and working out at the gym. Kathleen and Craig did separate on several occasions, but only for brief periods of time. Kathleen felt her relationship with Craig hit rock bottom during this period, but the couple was able to rebuild their marriage. Eventually, Kathleen became pregnant with her fourth child and again fixated on exercising so as to be as healthy as possible for the baby.
Laura Elizabeth Folbig was born on August 7, 1997, and soon underwent extensive medical examinations. A sleep study found that while she did not have obstructive sleep apnea, she did have mild central apnea, although this would resolve itself by the time she was six months old. Biochemical, metabolic, and blood tests all came back normal. She was sent home with a cardiorespiratory monitoring device to record and download information about her breathing and her heart rate while she slept. The device would set off alarm if it detected any decrease in either. The machine reassured Craig, but made Kathleen anxious because of its frequent false alarms. Laura was no longer prescribed to use the device after she turned a year old. Kathleen and Craig were understandably terrified of losing Laura like they had her siblings during the first year of her life. So when they were finally able to throw a first birthday party for one of their children, they held a big celebration to mark Laura's birthday. While Laura lived longer than her siblings, she also ultimately died suddenly. She passed away on March 1st, 1999, after Kathleen put her down for a morning nap when she was just shy of 19 months old. Her autopsy found that she had myocarditis, or an inflammation in her heart muscle. While all three professors of forensic pathology called at a later inquiry, stated that they would have listed Laura's cause of death as myocarditis because of how extensive it was. The forensic pathologist who performed the autopsy listed the cause of death as undetermined. They noted in their report that the family history of no living children following four live births is highly unusual. The possibility of multiple homicides in this family has not been excluded. The death of a fourth child in one family also caught the attention of the local police, and a detective was assigned to investigate Laura's death on the day it occurred. Following Laura's death, the Fulbig's marriage finally collapsed under the weight of their grief. They went to counseling, but Kathleen moved out of their shared home in April of 1999. She had moved back in by that June, but she and Craig were separated for good by June of 2000. It was during the first period of separation following Laura's death that Craig became suspicious that his children's deaths may have been caused by his wife rather than by natural causes. While cleaning up his wife's belongings in May of 1999, he came across a diary she had written between June of 1996 and June of 1997. He began reading it and was concerned by some of its passages. In October of 1996, Shortly before she came pregnant with Laura, she wrote, Obviously, I'm my father's daughter, while discussing making mistakes in her past. Since Kathleen's father was a murderer, Craig was alarmed that his wife seemed to relate to him. In another entry, she wrote, My guilt of how responsible I feel for them all haunts me. My fear of it happening again haunts me. What scares me most will be when I'm alone with the baby. How do I overcome that, defeat that? Craig took the diary to the police and was interviewed. During this interview, he said that he was suspicious that Kathleen had been involved in their children's deaths. He was asked to return for a second interview four days later. During the time in between these two meetings with police, Craig went to see his estranged wife and accused her of killing the children. Kathleen was appalled and slammed the door in his face. She later returned to the home she had once shared with Craig to yell at him, telling him that he knew how much she loved their children and that he needed to tell the police the truth. Craig recanted his earlier statement when he met with police again, and he and Kathleen temporarily reconciled a short time later. Kathleen was interviewed about the diary for eight hours one day that July. She stated that she felt like she was her father's daughter not because they were both murderers, but because she viewed him as a loser in general and felt like she was a loser as well. She felt guilt over the deaths of her children, not because she was their killer, but because she was their mother and she had failed to protect them from whatever it was that kept taking them from her. Authorities remained focused on Kathleen's diaries and asked her if she had any more. She turned over one she had just purchased, which she said was the only one she had. 
However, after investigators obtained a search warrant and searched her home, they found another diary, written between June of 1997 and April of 1998, in a bag inside of a case in the wardrobe in her bedroom. Kathleen claimed that she had not tried to hide the diary from police. She had just forgotten that she still had it. Police would eventually come into possession of six of Kathleen's diaries, with five other diaries from the period of time her children died, believed to be unaccounted for. These diaries would play a major role in the criminal proceedings that would eventually be held in connection to the deaths of the Fulbig children. On April 19, 2001, Kathleen was arrested and charged with the murder of all four of her children. When Kathleen went to trial in 2003, her diaries were a major part of the prosecution's largely circumstantial case. The prosecution claimed that certain passages all but admitted her guilt. I feel like the worst mother on this earth, scared that Laura will leave me now like Sarah did. I knew I was short-tempered and cruel sometimes to her, and she left, with a bit of help," Volbig wrote in one entry. It can't happen again. I'm ashamed of myself. I can't tell my husband about it because he'll worry about leaving her with me. The defense claimed that the passages were merely expressions of Kathleen's understandable feelings of maternal guilt and over-examination of everything she did in an effort to understand why her children kept passing away. The prosecution argued at trial that Kathleen had smothered all four of her children. However, there was no forensic evidence that the children had been smothered. Smothering sometimes leaves behind physical signs, but in some cases, it does not. Laura's death was slightly more difficult to attribute to smothering simply because of her age. At almost 19 months old when she died, she would have been physically strong enough to struggle against being smothered, which can result in certain characteristic injuries which she did not have. Furthermore, there were other known health factors that could have contributed to the children's deaths. Caleb had been diagnosed with a floppy larynx, which can make it difficult for an infant to breathe. The seizures Patrick experienced were severe enough that they could have resulted in his death. In this case, the charge against Kathleen for maliciously inflicting grievous bodily harm, alleged that she had tried and failed to smother him on the occasion of his first life-threatening event, which resulted in the brain damage that led to the seizures. If Laura had not been the fourth of her parents' children to die, her death would almost certainly have been attributed to the myocarditis found during her autopsy. However, at the time, there was no such known alternative explanation for Sarah's death. While the maxim was not explicitly invoked during the trial, the prosecution's case appeared to be highly influenced by what came to be known as Meadows' Law, which states that one sudden infant death is a tragedy, two is suspicious, and three is murder, until proved otherwise. This saying originated from Roy Meadow, a British pediatrician, who coined the phrase Munchausen syndrome by proxy to describe what is now also referred to as factitious disorder imposed on another, in which a caregiver either harms or creates the illusion of an illness in another person as an act of attention-seeking behavior. Meadow spent years collecting thousands of pounds of taxpayer money per trial, testifying against mothers accused of killing their young children, whose deaths also could have been attributed to SIDS. One of those women was Sally Clark, who was accused of murdering her two sons, both of whom had died suddenly. Meadow claimed that the odds of two children dying in a home such as Miss Clark's were one in 73 million, a figure which had absolutely no statistical merit. The actual odds were later calculated to be one in 77. Miss Clark was sentenced to life in prison in 1999, but her conviction was overturned in 2003 in light of Meadows' misleading testimony and the fact that a home office pathologist had failed to disclose that microbiology tests had indicated that at least one of her sons could have died as a result of natural causes. She never recovered from the trauma of losing her sons, being accused and convicted of their alleged murder, and being the target of abuse in prison because she was viewed as a baby killer. 
She died in 2007 of acute alcohol poisoning. At least two more convictions that relied on Meadows' testimony have also been overturned. The General Medical Council struck Meadow off of the medical register in 2005 after finding him guilty of serious professional misconduct for providing erroneous and misleading testimony in court. A high court judge overturned that ruling the following year. During Kathleen's trial, the case against her relied heavily on the premise put forth by Meadow that multiple deaths within one family have to be criminal. The prosecution argued that it was not obligated to prove that the children had been smothered or be able to disprove that they could have died of natural causes. I can't disprove that one day some piglets might be born with wings and that they might fly. Is that some reasonable doubt? No. Is the hypothesis that the defense advances a reasonable doubt? No. Why not? Because if you look at what they are suggesting, not in isolation, but in totality. There has never ever been before in the history of medicine that our experts have been able to find any case like this. It is preposterous. It is not a reasonable doubt. It is a fantasy. And, of course, the Crown does not have to disprove a fanciful idea, the prosecutor said during closing statements. The jury found this argument compelling. After almost nine hours of deliberation, they returned a verdict of guilty. Kathleen collapsed in the courtroom when the verdict was read. She was sentenced to 40 years in prison with a non-parole period of 30 years. Kathleen was sent to a maximum security prison where she spent 22 hours a day alone in her cell to prevent other inmates from attacking her and because she was considered high risk for harming herself. Over the following few years, she unsuccessfully ran through all of her rights to appeal her conviction. Her sentence was reduced during this process, down to 30 years in prison, with a non-parole period of 25 years. Her only remaining hope of proving her innocence and having her conviction overturned was directly petitioning to the New South Wales Attorney General in hopes of having an official inquiry opened into the case. In the years following Kathleen's conviction, the problems with Meadows' law became increasingly evident, and more research was carried out about the causes of sudden infant death syndrome. It should be noted that SIDS is a blanket term describing death in infants with no identifiable cause. Despite ongoing research, we do not fully understand what leads to the majority of these deaths. Parents are advised of certain preventative measures they can take, largely involving an infant's sleeping environment, but these only reduce the risk of a child dying from SIDS, not eliminate it. Furthermore, there is increasing evidence that deaths from SIDS have a variety of causes. In terms of Kathleen's case, the most significant development in SIDS research is the discovery that in certain cases, infant deaths are brought on by previously undiagnosed genetic conditions. More than 30 different genes that increase the risk of SIDS and the related syndrome sudden unexplained death in children, which affects children over one year of age, have been identified. According to current estimates, up to 35% of deaths attributed to SIDS actually have a genetic component. A new group of lawyers took over Kathleen's case in 2013, and they hired several medical experts to review the data from the case. One of these experts was Stephen Cordner, a respected forensic pathologist at Monash University. He spent over a year reviewing the children's medical data and the arguments presented at Kathleen's trial, eventually producing a 112-page report that argued that the medical data pointed to the phobic children dying of natural causes rather than by being smothered. This report was included with the official petition Kathleen's legal team filed in June of 2015, requesting that the Attorney General's office open a formal inquiry into the case. The petition was not addressed for three years. Finally, on August 22, 2018, Attorney General Mark Speakman announced that an inquiry overseen by former District Court Judge Reginald Blanche would be held. Kathleen's legal team hoped to be able to provide more solid evidence that the full big children had all died of natural causes, 
and therefore began exploring genetic causes that could explain why all of Kathleen and Craig's children had died so young. At the time, they did not have access to the DNA profiles of the Fulbig children, so they began their investigation by looking at Kathleen's DNA for clues. Professor Carola Garcia de Vinuesa, the co-director of the Center for Personalized Immunology at the Australian National University, was asked by Kathleen's legal team to lead the effort. She and a geneticist worked with a cheek swab and saliva sample that had been collected from Kathleen in prison and had the DNA extracted from the samples sequenced. When they sat down to study the resulting DNA data, they noticed something that could potentially be of vital importance in the case. Kathleen had a mutation in her CALM2 gene. The three CALM genes relate to the production of calmodulin in the body. Calmodulin plays a role in how calcium is transported into and out of cells, including cells in the heart. As such, one of its functions involves regulating the contractions and expansions of the muscles in the heart. Mutations in these genes can result in severe inherited cardiac arrhythmias. Variants in CALM genes were known causes of SIDS, as they could result in severe cardiac problems and sudden death in infants and young children. At the time it was discovered that Kathleen had this mutation, only about 75 people had been identified as having potentially lethal mutations in any of the three CALM genes worldwide. The specific mutation found in Kathleen had not previously been identified, or therefore linked to any deaths. Luckily, it was possible for Professor Vinuesa to follow up on this lead, as she was able to obtain DNA samples from all four of Kathleen's children. Two of the children had frozen tissue samples on file, and she was able to obtain DNA from the blood taken from the other two children at birth and preserved on their heel stick cards, which were still on file. Sequencing of their DNA showed that both Laura and Sarah Fulbig had inherited the mutation in the CALM2 gene from Kathleen. While Kathleen's two sons, Patrick and Caleb, had not inherited this mutation, it was later discovered that they each had inherited two copies of another exceptionally rare mutation. In their cases, the variation affected a gene referred to as BSN, or Bassoon. Again, this mutation is very rare, but it is known to cause early onset lethal epilepsy in mice. That is, it causes mice to experience seizures that are severe enough to result in their death while they are still very young. The deaths of the four full big children appeared to not have a single cause, as the prosecution had alleged during Kathleen's trial, but two separate genetic influences. The chances of two such rare genetic variants being in one family and causing four deaths seem almost incomprehensibly small. According to Professor Vinuesa, the overall small odds of Kathleen and Craig, both carrying rare mutations, are not as relevant as the high odds of them passing those mutations on to their children. In the end, it's not about these variations being very rare in the world, it's about the chances of Kathleen meeting someone like Craig and having this combination of mutations between both of them. Once genetics come into play, statistics go out the window, she has stated. Because of the novelty of the specific mutation found in Kathleen and her daughters, doubts were raised during the inquiry about whether or not it could be fatal. A pediatric cardiologist, who was called to testify during the inquiry, argued that since Kathleen herself was healthy and had lived into adulthood, it was unlikely that her daughters had died as a result of the mutation they shared. Kathleen did have a history of fainting episodes that began when she was a child, including an incident where she fainted while swimming, but luckily was rescued from the water by witnesses. Fainting while swimming is a specific symptom associated with long QT syndrome, which has been seen in individuals with CALM mutations. However, during the inquiry, Kathleen was given an examination and found to not currently be showing any signs of cardiac problems, including long QT syndrome. However, around the same time, evidence supporting the theory that the CALM2 variant carried by Kathleen and her daughters could have been lethal emerged. 
Professor Vinuesa was able to contact cardiovascular geneticist Peter Schwartz, who had just completed a paper examining data from the International Calmodulin Registry, which attempts to gather information from every individual and family affected by mutations in calm genes. One of the families he wrote about was an American family with a mutation almost identical to the one shared by Kathleen and her daughters. The family's two children had each suffered cardiac arrest at a young age, one at age four and one at age five. One child survived the cardiac arrest, but the other sadly did not. It was determined that the children had inherited the mutation from their mother, who was healthy. Professor Vinuesa viewed the discovery of this other family as a major turning point in the case that provided strong evidence supporting Kathleen's innocence. Other scientists doing research for the inquiry did not view the new evidence as being so crucial, maintaining that the mutation found in the Fulbigs was likely pathogenic, but still not a likely explanation for Laura and Sarah's deaths, in part because of their young age at the time of their deaths, and also because most deaths with cardiac causes tend to occur during highly active periods, and the two girls had died in their sleep. Data from the International Calmodulin Registry does not necessarily support these critiques in cases where mutations in the calm genes are concerned. The registry describes five families in which their mutation was fatal in some members who inherited it, but not all of them. Approximately 20% of individuals who died of a sudden cardiac event related to these mutations died in their sleep and nine sudden deaths occurred in children under the age of three. There was also a possibility that another form of stress, besides exertion, played a role in Laura and Sarah's deaths. Each of the girls had been sick and on medication when they died. Sarah had been prescribed an antibiotic for a cough, and Laura had a respiratory infection that was being treated with acetaminophen and pseudoephedrine. The cardiovascular stress from being ill and the medication, in combination with the altered heart rhythm caused by the mutation, which left the girls more susceptible to heart problems, could have led to their sudden cardiac-related deaths. The scientific arguments did not impress Judge Reginald Blanche, who oversaw the inquiry. In July of 2019, he ruled that there was no reason to doubt Kathleen Fulbig's convictions. While he acknowledged the scientific evidence presented at the inquiry and the possibility that Laura and Sarah had heart conditions, he wrote in his judgment, even on the basis of accepting the opinion of Professor Vinuesa, that it is now plausible that Sarah and Laura Fulbig may have had a cardiac condition and that that raises a possibility it caused their deaths. I do not consider the inquiry should be reopened for the purpose of holding further hearings about the CALM-2 variant identified in Sarah and Laura. As they had at her 2003 trial, Kathleen's diaries played a major role during the inquiry and in the judge's ruling. Kathleen's testimony during the inquiry to explain some of the passages used to point towards her guilt hurt her rather than helped her in the judge's estimation. In reaching his verdict, Judge Blanche argued that Indeed, as indicated, the evidence which has emerged at the inquiry, particularly her own explanations and behavior in respect of her diaries, makes her guilt of these offenses even more certain. Many excerpts from the diaries are difficult to understand, but Kathleen has always maintained that they reflect the depression, lack of control, and paranoia she was feeling after losing multiple children. In October of 1997, she wrote about Laura, wouldn't have handled another like Sarah. She saved her life by being different. Kathleen testified that she believed that her youngest daughter had not been taken from her so far because she was somehow different than her siblings. When Judge Blanche asked her if she believed some sort of supernatural power was taking her children from her, and she was hoping that Laura being somehow different prevented her from being taken by this power, she stated that she had believed something along those lines at the time. In discussing a January 1997 entry, in which she said she had done terrible things in the past when she was stressed, she stated, It's a broad spectrum of things that I am using the word terrible for. 
It could be me placing my child down to let her cry for even 30 seconds. That's a terrible thing, in my view. Judge Blanche claimed that the diaries were virtual admissions of guilt. Six separate experts who have examined the diaries have all had the opposite opinion. The most recent expert to study the diaries, clinical and forensic psychologist Dr. Katie Seidler, who has worked with violent incarcerated offenders for over two decades, has stated, there are no clear disclosures of any criminal or violent conduct in Ms. Fulbig's writings. Kathleen's legal team has also long been critical of short, cherry-picked phrases and sentences taken from over 50,000 words of Kathleen's writing being highlighted in court without context. Following this loss in court, Kathleen's lawyers applied for a judicial review of the inquiry's findings. While they waited to get a response, more and more scientific evidence supporting the theory that Laura and Sarah Folbig had died as a result of the variant in their COM2 gene they had both inherited from their mother was discovered. A biochemist in Denmark, with aid from scientists from six countries, was able to run tests on the specific mutation using a synthetic cell and was able to show that it was just as likely to be lethal as the more well-known mutations in calm genes. A major scientific study was published in November 2020, confirming that Laura and Sarah's deaths were most likely caused by the mutation. Specifically, their deaths were brought on by the variations of their heart rhythms caused by the mutation, which left them vulnerable to cardiac problems in combination with the medications the girls had been taking. On March 3, 2021, a petition signed by more than 90 prominent scientists and medical professionals from nine countries was sent to New South Wales Governor Margaret Beasley, requesting that Kathleen Fulbig be pardoned and freed from custody in light of the accumulating evidence that her children had died as the result of natural causes. Among those who signed the petition were two Nobel laureates and the president of the Australian Academy of Science. The petition argued that Kathleen Fulbig has endured the death of her four children and has been wrongfully incarcerated because the justice system has failed her by not properly taking the new scientific evidence into account. One of the signatories, John Shine, the president of the Australian Academy of Science, later stated, It is deeply concerning that there is not a mechanism to appropriately weigh up all the medical and scientific evidence in a case of this nature. There is now an alternative explanation for the death of the full big children that does not rely on circumstantial evidence. Three weeks after the petition was sent, the New South Wales Court of Appeal responded to the request for a judicial review of the Blanche inquest's findings. They dismissed it, arguing that Judge Blanche's ruling was not at odds with scientific evidence. It would be a full year before the petition was formally answered. The actions of New South Wales Attorney General Mark Speakman, who bore more of the responsibility for deciding how to respond to the petition than the governor herself, did not seem to indicate that he would be in favor of granting the pardon. The Australian Academy of Science had offered to provide him with a panel of expert geneticists to help him go over the scientific data in the case, but he rejected this proposal. Still, on May 18, 2022, Attorney General Speakman announced that while Kathleen Fulbig would not be granted a pardon, a second public inquiry would be held to ascertain if there were any reasons to doubt her original conviction. He did not believe simply granting a pardon was appropriate because the new genetic evidence needed to undergo further scrutiny. While he had not formed an opinion on Kathleen's guilt or innocence, or on whether or not there was reason to doubt her conviction, he did find that the scientific discoveries in the case did merit some form of intervention. When announcing the second inquiry, Speakman said that he had been in contact with Craig Fulbig and that he was truly sorry that he would have to go through another inquiry. Craig Fulbig believes that his ex-wife is guilty of murdering their children. Almost all of the further scientific inquiry into his children's deaths has focused on the calm to mutation his daughters inherited from their mother, who provided a sample of her DNA to researchers. 
However, further research into the deaths of his two sons has been hampered by the fact that scientists do not have access to Craig Volbig's DNA. Caleb and Patrick both had two mutated copies of the bassoon gene in question, presumably because they inherited one from each of their parents. However, Mr. Fulbig has refused to provide a sample of his DNA to confirm this. A directions hearing held in July 2022 found that Craig Fulbig's DNA was of vital importance for the inquiry, as examining it would allow scientists to determine if Caleb and Patrick, who were confirmed to have inherited one mutated copy of the bassoon gene from their mother, had inherited their second mutated copy of the gene from their father, or if it had been a de novo mutation. De novo mutations are not present in the parents of a child. They are instead spontaneous mutations in DNA that occur during early DNA replication of the child. Making this distinction would allow scientists to better determine if the mutation could be categorized as pathogenic or likely pathogenic. The lack of analysis of Craig Fulbig's DNA limits the scope of the analysis of genetic factors in the deaths of his two sons. At the hearing, it was also found that Mr. Fulbig could not be compelled to participate in the inquiry or provide a sample of his DNA. Mr. Fulbig's refusal to participate in the inquiry is largely due to financial constraints. He does not have the money to finance his legal representation for the inquiry and says that rather than being given the necessary funds from the Attorney General's office, he was given the suggestion to take out a loan against his home to pay for his lawyer. Mr. Speakman says his office did approve the use of discretionary funds for Mr. Fulbig's representation. However, according to Danny Ede, who previously represented Mr. Fulbig, this funding was limited and would only provide Mr. Fulbig with approximately eight days of representation, which is completely inadequate for an inquiry of this scale. The upcoming inquiry will be overseen by retired New South Wales Supreme Court Chief Justice Tom Bathurst and will be conducted in two parts. The first part will take place in November of 2002 and examine the medical evidence in the case and the second part will be held in February of 2023 to examine the psychological evidence. Regardless of the outcome of the inquiry and the credibility it may or may not give to the new genetic evidence, it will be a major moment in Australian legal history and shape the role science plays in the courtroom. If the new genetic evidence, supporting the theory that the full big children died of natural causes, is found to be valid, the inquiry will have to decide if circumstance or science is more important in the case.